press or in media and uh, Babu Elijah uh, is here. He is going to address this part, but also here we have our markers. So the first stage of the DG's address will be addressing all of us, after which when the DG is concluded the address for all of us, we will request the markers to be excused and then we will continue with the media. And then Mr. Elijah Mklanga is going to take over then to address all the protocols that are going to be required of us. Uh, DG, may we humble on behalf of our MEC, Babu Panyazali Sufi, and our head of department, Mr. Edward Msui, request the DG to address us, please. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Babu uh, Ngubani, the Chief Director for Exams. Uh, good morning, colleagues. Dimachirone. Koto. Good morning. Okay. Um, I don't like these. Uh, uh, visits that we make to marking centers uh, uh, be called roadshows because in the administration we don't have anything called roadshow. It's in uh, a nomenclature that is used by public uh, uh, office bearers. Uh, in the administration we talk about staff meetings. Uh, so this is a staff meeting. <laughs> So we are in a staff meeting. I want to thank Mr. Gubani, the Chief Director for Exams. Gauteng is doing exceptionally well. Uh, it's at the cutting edge of innovation uh, in modernizing exams. And the brain behind that is Mr. Gubani, uh, because things have started to unfold when he started working with the team. He works with a team of extremely capable men and women. And uh, part of that team uh, is sitting here. And we've elected not to go and speak to uh, all the markers, as we have done in December. In December, we had five marking centers. We went to each and every room, you can ask them, in Gauteng. In Limpopo, we did the same thing. They had three. In Pumalanga, they only had one, as part of staggered marking. Now, what we are doing is to talk to you and then walk through some of the marking rooms to check what is happening there, because that is important for us. And why we are here, or... Oh, why are we here, rather? And why is the media even here? Is that South Africans are concerned about your safety? When we announced the commencement of Maki, many people were extremely unhappy because they said, this is a recipe for a super spreader. When you bring people from different parts of the country, and you bring them under one roof. Uh, and when we had to get the permission of cabinet and the president, we had to commit that we will make sure that nothing is left to chance and uh, conditions won't fester for an outbreak or a super spread. We made that commitment relying on you, colleagues, because I just visit the centers but you are here every day, and we have to rely on you. So thank you very much for coming. I want to start by thanking you, appreciating the excellent role that you play in the value of marking, to standardize marking, to ensure that the quality of marking um, is what is expected of uh, this process. Uh, this, th these are expertise and skills that you have acquired over many years. Uh, you've never disappointed us. 
there is no reason for you to do it this time around. And just by coming here, it, it has humbled many of us. There are those who withdrew from marking, as you know, and I think Gauteng has got about 170-something, 70 which is the highest number if you put all the nine provinces together. But I really uh, want to commend the exam team uh, in terms of the speed at which they were able to move and replace those markers who could not pitch for this exercise. So thank you for having stayed the course, even uh, when we started experiencing the resurgence um, of the virus and uh, getting to the point of even the second wave. We are eternally grateful to you and your families, because we know that your families would have played a very important role in supporting you in taking that decision and the continued support that they are providing to each one of you. Convey your appreciation and thanks uh, to your family members as well. We are eternally grateful to you uh, for that. As Mr. Ngubani said, to me, you are, my, you are our superheroes. You are our unsung heroes and heroines. I, I'm talking about teachers. And you are here as markers, as a proxy of uh, teachers that we have out there. We were able to save the academic year because you made it happen. And by the way, when, when, when cabinet agreed uh, to, to allow us to continue with marking, they put uh, this condition. They said no marking center uh, should experience an outbreak. And I think I've said that. And we've committed that it, that will not happen. Because the president is very clear. If only one becomes a, an, a if only one experiences an outbreak or becomes a super spreader, all marking centers are going to be closed. All of them, not only one, um, for saving lives. So we have to work together, and that's why we are talking to you, to make sure that as part of a cohesive unit in the marking process, we ensure that nothing is left uh, to chance. I have no doubt in my mind that as you have done before, uh, you'll, you'll make sure that uh, uh, you know, health and safety is maintained from the beginning up to the end. The last point that I want uh, to put across is around health and safety. Um, for the first time in the history of public exams, we have placed health and safety as the apex of priorities. It's never happened before. I want to, I want to be woefully honest. You've got uh, uh, occupational health legislation and so on. We've been trying to adhere to that for all these years. But this year, we've made sure that it becomes the apex of priorities. Nothing should be above health and safety in the marking centers, not even the standard of marking. The standard of marking must remain subordinate to health and safety as a priority. And the logic is very simple, colleagues. If markers are not safe, are we going to get the required um, uh, standards of marking from them? Definitely not. The quality is going to be very poor. If the markers are not healthy, are we going to get uh, the output which is in keeping with the standards that you are looking for? We will not. So that's why health and safety has to remain a priority to every one of us. It should be your business as it is my business. Make it everyone's business in the marking room from the entrance up to the exit. In Gauteng, you carry a risk because your markers are commuting, are moving in and out. They are not confined in a residential area, and that is a risk. And therefore, you have to up 
your standard in terms of managing that risk. In the Eastern Cape, for instance, they have imposed rapid testing as a requirement uh, to enter the premises for marking. In other words, they test everyone who gets into the premises for marking. They start with the venue manager, they go to the support staff of, of the venue manager. If your results don't say you are negative, you are not allowed. It's not a guarantee, but at least it contributes uh, immensely to enhancing the environment for health and safety. Uh, you are able to do it in the Eastern Cape because, as we all know, the second wave started in the Eastern Cape and therefore government invested a lot in terms of facilities for testing their mobile clinics, which you don't get in all the provinces. Our desire would be that everyone must be tested before they come here. But unfortunately with you, it means because you are not residential, we'll then have to test you every day, which will not make sense at all. And, you know, medical uh, uh, experts will tell you that it won't make sense, but in, where you able to confine people to a residential area, in sports they call it a bubble. You stay within the bubble until you are done, then you can go home. Uh, but what I'm saying is that Gauteng has done what no province has done. You have employed eight compliance officers per marking center. It doesn't happen anywhere in this country. Eight. I mean, in the other eight provinces, you only have one compliance officer per marking center. So we expect in Gauteng 800% compliance. 800% compliance. In other provinces, at least, we'll expect 100% compliance. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed. I've, I mean, from what I've been able to observe, uh, it does appear that, uh, you know, compliance measures are in place right from the gate with the security. I mean, the protocol is being followed. Now is in our hands, brothers and sisters, to ensure that come the last day of marking, we look back with a huge sigh of relief and a smile behind our mask and say, thanks God, not even one center led to, you know, a, uh, an outbreak. And that is the responsibility that I leave with you because you are in charge of uh, the leadership of marking in every room where marking happens. And uh, together with the center manager, uh, uh, we are looking forward uh, to making sure that this center, people remain uh, safe and they remain healthy uh, because it's also about your families. The other danger, extended risk, is your families. If anything happens to you, it has a spillover effect to your families, to people that you interact with in the community. It will place a huge burden on, on, on the health services of our country which is already struggling. Thank you for indulging me. We are very proud of you. I'm extremely impressed with uh, the progress that I've seen so far. We report every week to Cabinet about Maki. That's the interest that Cabinet uh, has in this process. We report every week to the National Coronavirus Command Council. How is Maki proceeding? How many markers? have um, presented symptoms, how many have tested positive, you know, are people safe? We have to answer those questions. We are going to the National Coronavirus Command Council tomorrow uh, to again report for this week. We reported for last week. Thank you for indulging me. Best wishes for the rest of the marking duration. Hope to see you when we release the results. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, DG, for a very profound message. Colleagues, the DG, the message is very clear. Let's do it for ourselves. Let's do it for our local families, extended families, the whole society, the whole country. Please let us observe safety 
measures at all times. Colleagues, safety on that, first. safety first. Yeah. Colleagues, with that, uh, may we further request just one second, uh, uh, Elijah and DG. Colleagues, whilst the DG is talking about these safety measures, may I request that we stand up <coughs> and observe just a moment of silence in remembrance of our fallen hills, particularly that started the process of marking. Uh, two of them were involved in memo discussions, preparing your memo, standardizing it, but on the verge of starting with the marking, they had to succumb to this pandemic. Two internal moderators, one for history, Dr. Gangs Pillay, who passed on. The last time that uh, we saw him was when he was chairing the memo discussion and he was admitted in Pretoria. He couldn't even go home and he since passed on. The second internal moderator that we received the news this morning is Mr. Benedict Mohafe, who is the internal moderator for the Sisutu, who succumbed this morning. I made the reference as well. Oguti, the DG, is the chairperson of all the heads of departments in education, and we are so heartbroken also to report that one of the heads of department also, who was last seen chairing the meeting with the unions, discussing the protocols that are going to be implemented in the marking center, also passed on. So you see that in the midst of all these things, we still have you, and God is still with us. Let us observe a moment of silence in remembering of those things. Thank you. May the souls of the departed rest in eternal peace. Amen. Thank you, colleagues. All the markers are released, and we are going to hand over to Mr. Elijah uh, to deal with the second aspect. Thank you so much. Long enough, because you might have to move it like this, so that when the person presents, yeah, it's it's let's see. Yeah, it seems to be long enough. Really, see the person can present from here, then the screen is not yeah.
You look nice in the presentation, but it's not yours. <laughs> in the presentation. It's like you're ready to present. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm cool with this. Uh, <laughs> not speeches. Yeah. Okay, so colleagues, we have a statement which we have prepared, which we'll share. The DG will not read it word for word, but we'll share it when it's done, so you can pick up some of the facts that we we'll have shared in that statement. But there's a lot more in the presentation. We'll share the presentation as well. So that they're able to see what's, what's on it. And uh, yeah, so I think that don't, don't stress if you don't see anything on paper. We will we'll share via WhatsApp. Um, if, yeah, I assume so it's not a lot of us here. Some of you might have my number. So I'll send me a message and then drop the presentation for you. I think we're ready now. I'm going to ask the DG to. Um, start properly the media briefing with greetings and then he will take us through uh, his experiences of visiting all the my count was 97 DJ as of today of the, of the centers I might be wrong um, but uh, you'll give us the details and the experiences and then then uh, you'll then introduce me to the who will then make the presentation DJ over to you Thank you very much, Mr. Mshanga, and uh, good morning, colleagues uh, from the media and uh, from the Department of uh, Education in Gauteng, uh, the Department of Basic Education, which is the national department. Uh, thank you very much for coming and welcome. Uh, we want to welcome you to this technical briefing, uh, we indicated that uh, marking is taking place in uh, 181 marking centers across the country, involving 45,000 uh, markers, 
The first week of working took off extremely well. Uh, a few challenges there and there, mainly around uh, people who had withdrawn uh, from marking due to various reasons. And I'm sure uh, you would have received the explanation that we provided in the statement that we issued uh, last week. Some of the reasons uh, are that uh, people were bereaved and uh, in some instances uh, uh, families tested positive and people couldn't then pitch for marking because they happened to be part of those who needed to isolate until they get their results. But Eastern Cape did what no province has done. They subjected all their markers to a COVID-19 testing. And they were able to do that because they don't use uh, PCR, they use, uh, they call it rapid test. You get uh, tested on the spot, you're able to get your results within 30 minutes. And they use mobile clinics from the Department of Health, uh, which actually carried out uh, the tests. And the Department, uh, Department of Health was, ex was leading the process. It is not possible to have that in all the nine provinces. Ideally, would like to have it in all the nine provinces, but the investment made in the Eastern Cape afforded us the Eastern Cape uh, the ability to do so. In future, that's what we would like to do. We'll, we'll try and prepare for the um, half yearly exam uh, or the uh, exam that is taking place in, in May, June, and look at whether we can pilot for end of the year exam in terms of the National Senior Certificate. We've been monitoring the marking centers we started on Monday in the Northern Cape. Uh, we walked through the experience of the, not the Northern Cape, the Western Cape, the experience of the Western Cape in 11 marking centers. Uh, we, in the main, uh, impressed with what we experienced in the Western Cape. Of course, areas that require attention, we do bring them to the attention of provinces, for instance, would say to provinces, uh, some of the rooms are just too big. They must be broken into smaller rooms. The agreement is that you have a maximum of 20 markers in a room. In some of the big halls, you had more than that. And the risk is that if one marker tests positive, then all of those markers have to self-isolate and be subjected to, um, to testing. And by reducing the number of markers in a marking room, it helps to manage the risk uh, much better. We then moved to the Eastern Cape, which is where we came across uh, this wonderful experience of testing everyone before they get into the prison of, of marking. Uh, we visited 18 out of the 23 centers. centers. We still have uh, five centers that we still need to wrap up, and those centers are lying uh, close to KZN, so we'll cover them when we'll be doing KZN uh, this week. And then from Eastern Cape, we then move to the Free State. I mean, those who understand the geography of the country, if you are driving uh, like myself, it's easier to reach out uh, to those provinces in that way. But if you're flying, you can go anywhere. And by the way, we also drove to Cape Town to manage the risk, and uh, we were restricted to a maximum of three passengers in the car so that we observe social distancing. Getting into the plane, mingling with people, presents another risk. And that's why it was uh, somewhat uh, uh, better to drive, although it was demanding, I think it's par for the course. Uh, I mean, teachers are doing far much more than what some of us are doing. And we realized that going out just to monitor this, we could pay uh, that price. And then we, we covered all the centers in the Free State, 23 of them uh, we covered. And we were also impressed. I mean, the landscape of marking has completely changed. If you've been following marking, you'll agree with me that uh, 
what, what is happening this year has never happened in the history of uh, public exams. Over 125 years of uh, managing public exams, it has never happened. And that is because of elevating health and safety to be above everything else, to be the apex of priorities. And we mean it because, I mean, these markers, they knew the risks associated with coming here, and yet they took the risk. And therefore we have to reciprocate by making sure that the facility uh, is conducive to an environment that will make sure that they remain safe and healthy and they go back to families healthy and their families remain healthy. And then from the Free State we went to Northern Cape. Northern Cape has got only four marking centers. It's the biggest province in terms of land but you also know that in terms of population, they are, you know, sparsely populated. So they only have four marking centers, and all of them are in Kimberley. We covered all of them. Uh, and, and we did, you know, what we usually do, address the leaders, because we are unable to address every marker now. As I said, in December, we are able to get into the marking rooms, fewer people, smaller rooms, the other advice that we received also is that as part of managing the risk, we should not go to too many marking rooms because we are a risk ourselves. We move from one province to the other. So interaction with people has got to be reduced or limited. And then we, we went to, to the Northwest. Uh, in the Northwest, uh, they've got uh, 17 centers. We covered 14, we'll be wrapping up the three as we move out of Houten, they are here in Bretz and Hartebies uh, uh, Port Dam. So we'll be covering the last three uh, as we move out of Houten and uh, going to Limpopo and start with some of the centers in Limpopo that are this part of, uh, uh, yeah, this part of the country. Houten has got 26 centers. I think we are about to wrap them up. We did 16 yesterday, and before coming here, we did uh, three. And is this the fourth? Yeah, this is the fourth. This is the fourth. So with this one, we would have done four. And then uh, we'll be wrapping up what remains, and then be going to Limpopo, spend two days in Limpopo, cover all the centers. And as we go, we generate reports because we have to report to the minister, report to the NCCC as well, the National Coronavirus Command Council. And then after Limpopo, we'll be going to Mpumalanga. We'll spend two days there. And then after Mpumalanga, we go to the biggest system of the basic education sector. I mean, you'll appreciate that I've just been talking about. I mean, in the Eastern Cape, we spent two days in Western Cape, just one day, but in the fact that we had to, to drive in and then drive out. In Free State, we spent two days. And then in Northern Cape, we spent, I think, a few hours, because there are only four centers, and they are all in, in Kimberley. In Northwest, uh, we spent one day uh, to cover 14 centers so, as I said, the three will be covered. In Limpopo, we have planned for two. In Pumalanga, it will be two days. In KZN, because it's the biggest in the country, we're going to stay there for four days to cover the entire province. We've set aside four days for KZN to monitor marking. Also, given the fact that we've picked up some challenges in one center in KZN, uh, Escort, on, I mean, in the area of Escort, you would know that uh, one marker passed on, uh, who we were told went for marking, not feeling well, and uh, together with teacher unions and uh, other stakeholders, such as Association of School Governing Bodies, we've been encouraging teachers or markers not to come for marking when they don't feel well. They need to consult. Uh, before uh, they come for marking and if they are advised otherwise they, they shouldn't even come. And the last point that I want to make is that we have weekly meetings with teacher unions 
and I'm aware that some of, some of them have been interviewed by you. We had uh, the, first, the second meeting. The first meeting was on the 31st of December, New Year's Eve. Uh, and we also met with the Association of uh, School Governing Bodies and professional bodies uh, in the basic education sector. And then the second meeting happened last Saturday. So we meet every Saturday to brief them on the developments of the week that was. And uh, the next, uh, uh, yeah, what you are going to take next is going to be an update, a technical report, uh, which will be done by Mrs. Priscilla Okubanjo. Mrs. Priscilla Okubanjo is the director for public exams. If you have any questions about national senior certificate, this is the person. She is our expert uh, nationally in terms of public exams. That's why we thought that uh, she has to lead this technical briefing and she'll take you through the technical report that we have prepared as an update of marking. Over to you, Sister Priscilla, and thank you. Thank you very much, DG. Um, thank you and good morning to everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, as the DG already mentioned, you know that the NSC and SC combined uh, examination, the marking is currently in progress, and I'm here to give you an update. DG already started with some. I think he already gave you a snapshot of what is going on from his monitoring activities, but I'm just going to give you a little more detail. We'll go through a presentation, um, and the outline is there. I'm not going to go through uh, reading the outline, but I want to say that uh, across all the 177 marking centers that we expected to be operational at this stage, they are actually in operation. So all our marking centers are fully in operation. And while we remember that the country is still on the adjusted risk alert level three, every effort is being made across all the marking centers to ensure the safety of all the marking personnel. Marking is being conducted, as you heard already from DG, under very strict conditions, compliant with health and safety. Health and safety is actually paramount before anything else. Because, of course, if you don't have well and alive markers, then you will not be able to, to mark. Now, the health and safety uh, requirements are outlined in the protocol for the marking of 2020 examinations which was actually uh, prepared and sent out to provinces before the marking started. In terms of the management plan, the schedule was for marking to begin across the country from the 4th of um, January and terminate on the 22nd of January. So by the 4th, about four provinces had already uh, commenced, moved into their centers, and uh, the remaining five PEDs commenced uh, on the 5th and 6th, but uh, certainly now all the 177 centers across the nine provinces are fully in operation. And at least 94% of the 46,024 markers that are expected for this session have reported. I know that this, there's been an issue of uh, withdrawals, but you can see that 94% uh, of our markers did uh, report. And so far, 0.5% of them have tested positive, either on arrival or a few days after they got to the marking center. Now, just to give you a little bit of information about the processes uh, at, that took place at the opening of the center. Normally, at the opening of the marking center, you have your security setup. And so we started with the security setup and receipt of scripts at the different marking centers. And then it was briefing of uh, the marking center management by the provinces. And of course, after that, there was orientation of your chief markers, internal moderators, and um, the markers after they came. But in all of these briefings, I think one thing that was paramount this year is the fact that the orientation 
on the national protocol on marking, which has to do with the adherence to the COVID-19 safety protocols, featured prominently. It was top of the agenda in all of the orientation uh, sessions. And of course, as well as screening on arrival uh, and the completion of the health questionnaire by everyone who was entering the marking uh, center. That was also mandatory. If you didn't uh, screen, you would not be allowed to enter the marking center. In fact, the marking center uh, is sacrosanct in terms of visitors. Visitors are not allowed. Only marking personnel as well as those who are monitoring or who are coming for quality assurance of marking. Now, with regards to the protocol, which of course was developed in line with the COCTA regulations and all our standard operating procedures, pro provinces were also requested to use all of these documents even in their, in their training. They were free to use those. But even if they used only the protocol, it, would, it was already aligned in terms of um, uh, uh, the regulations. Now, as per the directions, there were four key aspects. Our marking centers were to host more than 50 marking personnel. Now, remember that uh, in terms of their alert level, we're talking about 50 uh, uh, people in indoor events. But our marking centers are usually uh, schools that uh, accommodate more than 1,000 learners. And therefore, they have the capacity to accommodate that many. So most of them are hosting more than 50 uh, marking personnel, and that was one of the things we accommodated in the directions. In addition, the marking center may not exceed 50% of its capacity. So we could go up to half the capacity of the marking center. We could go up to 20 markers per room, as you heard the DG saying, even in the monitoring that we've gone around and how many we have seen across all provinces. Most provinces are trying to adhere to this. In cases where they're using larger rooms, they're, they're, they're adding one or two, but I think we are discouraging that. To just to make sure that if one person gets infected, you don't have too many people uh, uh, being close contacts. In a school hall, we said they should not exceed more than 50% of the capacity. But we have limited the utilization of school halls. Most of the time, they're using classrooms. And even when school halls are used, there are few numbers there. Now, key to, uh, I think, one of the, the, the most important features of what has happened in the 2020 uh, marking uh, 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 which we've just which we are conducting this year is the fact that every marking center has a COVID-19 compliance officer. The DG even commended um, how thank for having eight compliance uh, officers in one marking center. There are a couple of other provinces that have also uh, multiple compliance uh, officers. For example, uh, in the case of Mpumalanga, I think they have three. Uh, compliance officers in each marking center, and you also have two in the, in the Northern Cape for each marking center. And as we're going on, the provinces are also looking at even increasing the number of compliance officers in each of the marking centers. And you would wonder, what is the role of those? Of course, when you put down regulations and rules, you, you know that uh, you, you have to make sure people comply because it's of no value if those regulations and protocols are there and people are not adhering to them. And so the marking uh, uh, center compliance, COVID-19 compliance officer's role is to ensure that people actually comply with those protocols. The usual protocols we know of wearing of masks, social distancing, high, hand hygiene, etc. But in addition to that, making sure that the organization of markers in the marking rooms do not go beyond the 20 that we have prescribed, that there's compliance also in hostels, in the accommodation, uh, in, in, in serving of refreshments and meals, in the management of even the screening questionnaires that are completed you know, on arrival, and the screening procedures that go on on a daily basis. So all of that uh, is the function of the COVID-19 compliance officer. And if you look at the fact that provinces have even uh, appointed uh, uh, many of these officers in every marking center. You can see how seriously this aspect is being uh, considered. Uh, in addition, there was um, a liaison between the Department of Health and health services that are in the vicinity of all marking centers. I think that was one of the things that the provinces uh, uh, were also requested to do so that if there, are, there, 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 there is any uh, emergencies or whatever, then the compliance officer as well as the marking center management 
know exactly where to get ready help. So the link between the Department of Health and health practitioners or health services or health facilities that are around the area where all marking centers are situated was also one key uh, thing in the protocol that was also implemented this year. Daily screening of all marking personnel and people entering the marking center. And DG already spoke about the mandatory testing uh, that Eastern Cape rolled out. Um, of course, because they were, I'll say, in the eye of the storm, you know, when the, the, the second wave uh, started. And, and certainly going forward, if we have to live in this, uh, in this way for, for a little longer, I think that is one thing that we would like to roll out across all uh, provinces, that there is mandatory testing for markers. Just to give you a little bit on the progress, on day one, which was the 4th of January for a number of provinces, but the 5th for others, depending on when they arrived, internal moderators, chief markers, and senior markers arrived on, the, on day one, and thereafter, the markers arrived on day two. Then they continued with the marking standardization processes, which include the marking guideline discussions that was conducted, and most provinces followed an adapted approach of training. So instead of having groups and big teams like we used to have in big halls and the chief marker speaking to 300 people at a time, there were adapted approaches where you had uh, the training actually decentralized and also facilitated by deputy chief markers and senior markers in smaller groups. The training also involved the um, practicing on six dummy scripts or marking six dummy scripts and only markers who were able to mark within the tolerance range in more than 50% of those scripts, so in other words, in at least four of the six scripts were authorized to mark the live scripts. But by the 8th of January, which is Friday last week, all the provinces had completed their training and they had completed authorization and full marking of live scripts had started by the 8th across the entire country. Now this is just showing you uh, an indication of the numbers of markers that we, uh, we have per, per room in terms of how the provinces have organized just to make sure that they avoid too many people in the room because if one person tests positive in that room, then the rest of the markers in the room have to be isolated. They have to be isolated, they have to be possibly tested if they're having symptoms, and there's a possibility that you, know, you might find out that the entire uh, team would have to be released. So to avoid a situation where you have to close down uh, uh, large numbers uh, in, in, a, in a subject or in a paper, or possibly the entire marking center, we hope it doesn't ever get to that. We had to go through, um, go with this uh, uh, method of having fewer people per classroom. And you can see the different numbers according to the different provinces. In the free state, there are just 12 markers in a room in, in Gauteng between uh, 13 and 15 markers, etc. as you go through the different provinces. Now, this slide, I think, gives us a, a good picture of where we are uh, currently, let me say as of yesterday, because we're working with a very fluid situation here and you know that on a daily basis, in fact, hourly things are changing, numbers are changing, uh, the progress is also uh, moving. We normally have a 12-hour marking day of which 10 hours are active marking and two hours are for uh, refreshments, teas and lunch. And so um, every hour there's a whole lot of production. So I might tell you this is where they are now, and by the time you go after lunch in two hours' time, they have moved. So it is very intense. But however, with regards to the number of markers that were expected at the marking center as of yesterday, in the free state, 2,138 were expected, but 60 withdrew. And as DG spoke in his uh, introductory remarks, there were various reasons for the withdrawals. You know, some of them, uh, for example, they, they come to the marking center and they find that a, a spouse or a family member has tested positive, uh, you know, just a day uh, after they left. So they're compelled to go back home because they also possibly have to go and isolate. Uh, in other cases, they are bereaved or whatever. So for various reasons, people withdrew. In the case of the Free State, it was 60. And from the Eastern Cape, out of the 5,325, 379 withdrew. 
Kauteng, 827. I think that's the largest number that we drew. But if you look at the fact that Kauteng appoints over 12,000 markers, in terms of the percentage, it's actually less than 10% uh, of the markers that we drew in the case of uh, Kauteng. Uh, KZN, the biggest uh, in the system, 8,730 markers were expected, only 110 withdrew in the case of KZN. Limpopo, 370 withdrew. Mpumalanga, 106. Northern Cape, 66. Northwest, 158. Western Cape, 609. Western Cape is a little bit of a concern because if you look at the total number of markers expected in the, in the Western Cape, 3,450 markers were expected in the Western Cape, and 609 out of that number is about 18%. Actually, that's one of the only provinces that goes beyond 10% uh, withdrawals. Most of your other provinces are ranging between 6 and 7%, or even lower. In the case of Mpumalanga, I think about 2% or 3%, and, and other provinces much lower than that. But um, then we go to the number of markers that tested positive and have been released from the marking center, which means uh, after they came to the marking center, they tested positive, and so they had to be released. Or in some cases, in the case of the Eastern Cape, they, they did not even enter the marking venue because remember, there was a mandatory testing at the gate, at the entrance, and if they tested positive, they were not allowed to go in. So the 168 you see at Eastern Cape, that happened at the gate, they never got into the marking center. The three in the free state were part of the marking. They developed symptoms, they went to test, and they tested positive, and uh, they were released to the health facilities to go and isolate. And you can see the numbers going down. Unfortunately, in the case of KZN, we, we put the plus one there because the plus one is the, the one fatality that we had at the escort uh, center. And, and we know that about three uh, markers uh, from that number seven, about three markers have actually tested positive from that center. But the province is already uh, um, doing a mandatory testing of all the markers at escort. Uh, you, you, in the case of ESCOT, there are two papers being marked there, which is Economics Paper 1 and Paper 2. And I think as of yesterday, uh, to my knowledge, they had already tested the Paper 1 group and will be continuing this morning uh, with the Paper 2 group. But the, the nine markers who were in close contact with the one marker who passed on had been in isolation since then and they were tested and they all, it all came negative, so we're happy about that. Now, when you look at Limpopo 11 plus 17, the 11 tested positive, the 17 did not necessarily test positive. Now, what happened with the 17 is that they just felt that they were sick and they needed to go home. And so some of them came and indicated they were feeling sick and they didn't want to stay. Others were bereaved and others said they feel that it's as if they are developing symptoms, whether it was psychological or, or actually physical but the province allowed them to go. So basically, Limpopo released 28 of their markers, uh, 11 confirmed positive, and the other 17, we would call them suspect. I, I don't even really want to say suspect because there's no proof that they were really that. They just indicated themselves that they were sick, and, but they never did any test. Now, you can go down the, uh, the column, and you see Mpumalanga is 9, Northern Cape 4, Western Cape 7, Northwest 3, uh, centralized marking, I put the centralized marking, that is the center that is run by the DBE, centrally in Pretoria, and there are two. So a total of 238 across our centers have tested positive and have been uh, released. Um, on the uh, uh, second uh, uh, column from the, from the right, you see the marking start and end dates there. We've also provided that in case you are interested in knowing when all of this will happen. Remember, the marking is scheduled to conclude on the 22nd, but there are a number of uh, provinces that might finish before the 22nd. You can see in the case of Limpopo, their target is the 19th, and in the case of Northern Cape, is the 15th, and others by the 17th, 18th. So we're hoping that by the weekend, we'll begin to see uh, a number of uh, uh, teams packing out of the marking center. And we can't wait for them, because we really want to have our teams finish and go back home uh, safely as quickly as possible. Now, yes, we're not saying that this marking session has been without challenges or the ant challenges that we might still uh, face until the end, but we have already uh, looked at this and uh, uh, um, preempted by looking at mediation or mitigation strategies 
for whatever challenges that we envisage. Now, in, 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 ter in terms of the shortage of markers due to withdrawals and decline, we actually did uh, envisage that some markers will decline. Some will be afraid. I mean, anybody would be afraid, given the conditions. But I think as soon as they saw the safety protocols that the department was putting uh, in place, a number of them were confident to come to the marking center. But others withdrew as a result of that. And for various other reasons, some because they were bereaved or whatever. So for these declines and shortages, the plan already was that each province will appoint a minimum of 10 to 15 percent of reserve markers for every paper in each subject. And usually the regulations allow us to, uh, to appoint up to 10 percent. But we went to 15. In fact, some provinces went even up to 20 percent. And so it wasn't a problem for them to replace the markers that uh, have withdrawn. Um, so far, in terms of the total nationally, we have about 2,700 markers that we drew, and that forms about 5.9%. Even if we approximate it, that's about 6% withdrawals. But then the reserve list goes up to 15% or 20%. Therefore, there were more than enough uh, um, uh, reserve markers to call up to actually um, come and, and take, take up the vacancies. Now, another thing was the extended marking days. Now, the marking for this year is scheduled to, to span through 18 days. Usually, in terms of our exam uh, uh, um, processes, we find that we can actually mark in 12 to 14 days. And so, in previous years, our marking has always been between uh, 12 and 14 days, 15 days maximum. So, where you have 18 days, those extra four to six days were actually included there in the plan to make up for extended time in case there is a need for marking to be extended. So you're going to find that there are a few provinces that might go up to the 22nd, which is using the entire 18 days, but there are most of them and certain subjects that will finish within 12 days or 10 days. Remember that even within a province, there are certain subjects that could finish a bit earlier. So, but, but this time was calculated in and planned in so that if there is a reason to extend, then there is the leeway to do that. The shared accommodation is another challenge. Uh, unfortunately, our schools are, uh, you know, they, our, our schools are not built in a way that you have uh, single uh, rooms. Usually you have dormitories or you have two in a room or four in a room or whatever. And, and at this time, currently, we would, the preference would be for all markers in, in the case of residential marking in provinces that are doing residential marking, for all markers to have their own individual rooms. It has not been possible to do that, but they have gone with having uh, no more than 50%, I think that's the stipulation, no more than 50% of the capacity of the room. So where the room was supposed to accommodate four uh, learners, uh, uh, they're supposed to have only two markers uh, in there. Now, a number of provinces also have B&Bs uh, and, and, and other accommodation facilities that they have engaged their services, you know, those that are close by, that markers could also stay and travel on a daily basis. So they've actually gone out of their way to do that. We do know that um, in some provinces, unfortunately, they are still battling with uh, accommodation, but we're also uh, dealing with that as we are monitoring provinces uh, closely uh, on a daily basis. Now, reliability and validity of marking due to replacements. Um, we said we're putting health and safety first but we also are making sure that the reliability and validity of marking is not compromised. That at the end, when we finish, we can be able to say to the public that this marking was reliable and this marking was accurate and the candidates have actually got the scores that they deserve to get from this marking process. And so where there were concerns about us replacing markers midway and, you know, how will a marker come in, he has not been trained and whatever, the extended time is actually making up or providing the time that we need for the training uh, uh, of those replacement markers. And in the case of each team, 
Um, you, you, you heard previously in the announcement we had uh, earlier about some uh, um, of our colleagues who unfortunately have succumbed to the uh, disease. Some of them are chief markers and internal moderators, and you have to promote others. So even in the planning, there were a lot of deputy chief markers, senior markers, experienced ones that were appointed as part of the plan, so that if there was any need to replace a chief marker or an internal moderator, you had a number of experienced people that you could choose from. Just like you had reserves at the level of markers, you also had reserves at each of the marking personnel levels, all, all the way up to chief marker and uh, internal moderator. Now, on-site moderators also have been deployed from the Department of Basic Education, uh, and their job is to conduct quality assurance of the marking and to provide support to the provinces where necessary, just to ensure that the quality of the marking is also uh, maintained. Markers testing positive after reporting, yes, that's another challenge. Um, and I think the, 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 the protocol is clear in terms of what to do when a marker tests positive at the marking center. How do you replace the marker? How do you decontaminate? How do you, what are the safety precautions that you follow? How is the marker safely removed from the marking center and taken to a health facility? All of that is in the protocol, and our compliance officers are there to ensure that that happens. And so far, as I said, 238 of the markers have tested positive. That's 0.5%. It is half percent, and uh, although we say it is low, we would rather not even have any marker testing positive. We would want to have 0.0. .0. So even 0 0.5 for us, we consider it uh, high because every, everybody's uh, life and health matters uh, a lot to us. Financial implications. Remember, we're extending uh, the days of the, the marking. Um, uh, uh, we, we are approximately going to be using 18 days, as I said. And so there will be financial implications uh, 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 for this particular marking. But you also note the fact that in 2020, the June 2020 examinations were postponed and they were merged with the November 2020 exams. And therefore, whatever savings we had in terms of the June exams uh, being merged, uh, that should cushion the issue of uh, the financial uh, implications that will arise from the extended marking of, of this, this year. I just want to give you a little bit of information about uh, centralized marking because I mentioned it somewhere earlier on in the presentation. With regards to centralized marking, the, the, the DBE actually is managing uh, centrally at a national level the marking of certain subjects. Now, these subjects are, by nature, very small enrollment subjects. In, in, in other words, it makes it impossible for the provinces to appoint uh, markers at the different levels of quality assurance. Remember that a paper uh, of a, a candidate is supposed to be marked, a script is supposed to be marked by different levels, must be marked by a marker if at, at a question level, must be marked by maybe three or four markers, depending on the number of questions in, this, in the script, and then it must go to a senior marker and then to a deputy chief and all of those different levels of quality assurance. But when you have very few uh, candidates offering a subject, Maybe you just have five in a province. It makes it difficult for a province to appoint a whole team of five or six people just to mark five scripts. And because of that, you find that the quality assurance might be compromised because then in terms of the, 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 the norm time, you are only supposed to appoint one person, which means that person must do everything, which now compromises the quality assurance. So to prevent that, the DBE pulled all the subjects together and pulled all the resources from different provinces and we are centrally marking six first additional languages, five second additional languages, and four content subjects. The four content subjects are listed there, music, dance, agricultural technology, and agricultural management practices. In the other subjects where uh, there are low numbers, but the numbers are high in other provinces, then you have provincial bilateral arrangements where the scripts can be moved to another province for marking. But very key to our centralized marking is the marking of South African sign language home language. Since the inception of uh, sign language, it has never been marked anywhere. It's, it's, it's a subject that has been marked only uh, centrally by the DBE. And um, so those are the subjects that are in the centralized marking. A total of 158 markers were expected. There were 18 withdrawals from the centralized marking. Uh, the, 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 
uh, sign language team, I think, was one of those that was hit in terms of the uh, withdrawals. But then we have managed the situation in that there are enough markers uh, uh, to mark two papers immediately. And so paper one and paper three are being marked simultaneously by the marking teams. There are enough markers to do that. And finally, after that, they'll be pulling together to mark literature, which, of course, all of them teach us as teachers. So that is also going very well. In the case of other subjects, uh, where we have some uh, withdrawals. The scripts, as I said, are quite few. There are very, very few scripts. Some of them are less than 50, some are less than 100. In that case, extending the marking just by an extra day is enough to solve the problem. And that is what uh, the, the venue, or, or what, that is what we are doing in terms of uh, centralized marking for those subjects that we had uh, withdrawals. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I think basically that is the story in terms of where we are currently uh, and the data that I've given you as of yesterday. So we're saying that the mapping of the 2020 combined NSC and SC exam is taking place against a very fluid and dynamic context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And therefore, there is need for us to strictly manage the conditions that must comply with the health and safety requirements outlined in our protocol for marking of the 2020 exam. And Close monitoring of the centers daily is paramount on our agenda. And that is why you see the, even the DG is moving and actually going to almost every single uh, marking center when he, he goes to a province. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bubango. Thank you for that uh, presentation. Quite informative indeed. Um, colleagues, we will now go to question time. Um, yeah, I'm seeing one hand already. Uh, <laughs> okay, DG, I'm standing here now as instructed. Um, okay, Masago. Okay. Uh, let's focus on Maki. If they are outside of marking, then we'll do outside of this room. <laughs> um, okay, Angela. Angela from SABC Radio News, uh, DG. Um, I think those are the two questions that we have to deal with. I'm going to ask DG to come stand here. Do you have something to write here? Uh, yeah. No, thank you, Mr. Mplanga. Thank you, colleagues from the media. Uh, well, I, I wanted to, to, to intervene and appeal to Mr. Mklanga to allow you even questions that are outside marking. But... Uh, he, okay. All right. So, um, meeting the date for the release of the results, there is nothing at the moment uh, which poses uh, any uh, threat or a risk uh, in affording us to meet the release of the results on the 22nd by the minister and MECs on the 23rd of February. 
And these days, I mean, Makim finishes on the 22nd. But as explained, as we're moving from one center to the other, the smaller subjects are already done. Uh, the big subjects will probably run up to the end. And the other explanation provided is that if you are unable, like in the case of the Western Cape, the withdrawals uh, are much higher than uh, you know, anywhere else. But uh, uh, even in the case of the Western Cape, when we were there on Monday, we had a meeting. The head of the department was there to receive us. Mr. Uh, Brian Schruder himself was there. The head of exams was also there. And uh, we were assured that uh, it was a challenge to deal with replacements, but it was not an insurmountable challenge. And when we were there, they said to us, no crisis at all. When I was in the Eastern Cape and we had to report to the NCCC last week, I called all heads of exams in the nine provinces to just give us an update in terms of the replacements, including Western Cape, by the way. They had said uh, to us that they managed uh, to get the replacements for the 18% of the withdrawals that they, they, they experienced. Now, the other one is about 200 uh, markers who tested positive. Uh, what is uh, the proportion of people who had contact with those markers? Well, I'm not sure whether we've got the, the exact figures, but we follow what is uh, recommended by WHO. Whoever was within the uh, prison of the surrounding, rather the, the, the prison, uh, or within a close um, contact with uh, such people, they have to be isolated. If, for instance, a marker in a room tests positive, all those markers have to be isolated, all of them. Isn't it, sister? Yeah, the whole. And by the way, in a room, you'll find that uh, they are sitting uh, in batches of five or, 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 or seven. Sometimes you get them four, depending on the size of the room. Now, you isolate the whole lot, not just those who are sitting. No, they could, co they could continue with marking, and then, uh, but they are taken outside the rest of uh, the others. Emma, is that the right answer? Yes, in yeah. some cases. Uh, in some cases, uh, DG, you, you, you're right. Like in the case of Escort, mm. where they had a B and B to isolate all nine of them, okay. they could continue with whatever they were doing there. Mm. But when you don't have such a situation, we still just isolate them. Uh, also, if somebody begins to show symptoms, then you know that it was followed yeah. the other route to go to the medical facility and the, the, the Department of Health Quarantine. So, so for the different provinces, depending on the specific circumstance, they have followed this protocol. But certainly the entire room, as DG is saying, everybody in the room was, even if you were sitting at that corner, you know, and the other person was sitting five meters away in the room, the entire room is isolated. Those are the only two questions. Um, yeah, thank you, DJ. Uh, I think there's a follow-up. <laughs> there's a follow-up from Matlako there. Um, so maybe don't go too far. Matlako, your question. Uh, DJ, I think maybe for parents that are sitting at home and there's a general concern we are seeing in the numbers. What is the stance of the department in terms of the reopening of schools? Um, okay. What are you going to advise the provinces to do? When schools closed, we were on a different level in terms of um, the again, levels that have um, been you know, put to us as a country. What is the plan of, um, of the provinces? Will you also be giving um, schools as well, you know, schools will you be resupplying them with sanitizers and the, the masks? Uh, what, what are the expectations there? What are the plans in, in terms of, of that? And I mean, is there something that was budgeted for? Because I think closing. When schools closed, there wasn't, didn't have this second wave that it has now clearly 
uh, taken course, and the second strain, which we are told is uh, also dangerous for the children as well. Thank you. Okay, did you, okay, is there a follow up question? Yeah, well, we talked about two open. Can you give us an update on the teacher assistance that we're going to be Okay. All right, that's fine. Uh, and there's another one, no? Um, just a brief one about the bubble. We've seen quite a few reports of people posting pictures that um, some of the accommodation at some of the schools in the bubble are extremely full. Um, it's beyond the capacity that Mr. Silla has spoken about. Um, what is the plan there? And when you are in the process, will you at all be going into some of those accommodation rooms just to see what they're they doing there? Okay, is that all for now? Okay, great stuff. DJ, over to you. Well, thank you very much once more for the questions and the comments. Uh, well, fortunately, we have indicated that we're going there, in, uh, we're going to Limpopo, and we'll be going to each and every marking centre. Um, um, I will talk to Mrs. Okubanjo, she would have received the complaints that you are referring to. But I do remember that in a meeting with teacher unions and other stakeholders on Saturday, that point was raised. There was an issue about one centre which accommodated about 800 uh, markers. The unions themselves said, through our intervention, uh, you know, that was addressed and uh, that big venue had to be broken into smaller manageable venues. If there are other issues other than that one, I'll be happy to address them as soon as I'm there. And even on my way there, I'll get an update from the HOD of education in Limpopo. We'll definitely address them. And then... Uh, opening of schools. Schools reopening. Well, schools are scheduled to reopen on the 25th of January for the teachers and the school management team and for learners on the 27th. Now, our risk adjusted differentiated uh, uh, strategy um, indicated that uh, schools wouldn't be allowed to operate at alert level five. At alert at, at, yeah, at alert level five, it's locked down, right? At alert level four, you allow for uh, exit grades such as grade 12 and grade seven. At alert level three, you'd be able to bring in most of the grades, right? And that was the risk adjusted differentiated strategy which we presented. Uh, uh, to even the net joints of uh, the director generals, which was appreciated and we encouraged to follow that in terms of dealing with, with the virus and dealing with hotspots in particular. And that risk adjusted differentiated uh, strategy allows us to deal with areas differently. If you have a hotspot and the situation is such that it's, it's impossible to get schooling running there, you obviously have to opt for a different option of either supporting learners being at home through ICT um, and, and not run schools as it would happen where it would be permissible to, to do so. But our team, our, our team of researchers in the Department of Basic Education, led by Professor Martin Gustafsson, and Martin and, me, and his team have been extremely useful to get us information, even in informing our plan to reopen schools after lockdown. And they've been able to research on what has been happening in the whole world, and they've been doing that even now. There's a piece of work that they have done uh, to look at the data of what has been happening recently in terms of mortality rate, in terms of admission rate, uh, admission also your ICU um, and other variables that they factored in. 
and uh, the outcome of that exercise indicates that there is not there is not a significant uh, variation from what was picked up before in terms of the impact of the virus, including the you know the the, the variant that we are referring to, uh, which uh, seem to be spreading faster and have a, a higher you know load of infection than the previous one. So their analysis is that uh, it seems to be the same virus. Uh, it doesn't seem to reflect any uh, significant impact in terms of mortality rate, in terms of admission rate, even of learners. They've been using the data from the Department of Health, and we use that data also to uh, put together a plan that is going to the, to the National Coronavirus Command Council in a meeting tomorrow, uh, and uh, that uh, meeting will probably decide whether they allow us to proceed with the reopening of schools as indicated earlier on. But from our side, the dates are the ones that I've communicated. We met in December to plan for the reopening. We're going to do follow-up a week before the reopening, um, which is next week with all the nine provinces one-on-one -on -one to check their state of, state of readiness. COVID essentials, we provide, we're still providing them in the same way as we did before. They are provided to schools. So, did I answer the one that she asked? Oh, teacher assistance. That was done in December. And some of them called me throughout December who were not paid. And we made sure that they were paid. We met with them in the centers that we visited. They are working until March. Yeah, they are working. They are working. They have started working in some in November, some in December. They are very happy. Some send me messages to say, thank you very much. I got a salary for the first time. Yeah. Okay, thank you, DJ. Uh, thanks, colleagues. That brings us to the end of this briefing. I think, uh, yeah, we, it was useful. Um, if there's a need for more information, let's continue con Versing in those uh, channels that we have. Thank you so much. Thanks, DJ. Thanks, Ms. Okibanjo. Travel safely. Thank you. Keep wearing the masks and uh, sanitizing. I had to keep my mask on. This no, 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 this no. no, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can, can, I, can I take this? Yeah, yeah, okay. I need to see what about the last thing? Oh, you're somewhere. Yes, they work under the same legislation as the last